Good afternoon, everyone, and on behalf of the Friends of the Village Library of Cooperstown, welcome to the Sunday Speaker Series for 2021-2022 with Lucy Schaefer and her presentation, School Lunch, Unpacking Our Shared Stories. My name is Leanne Hirabayashi, and I'll be co-moderating the session with Maureen Murray. Thank you all for joining us. Let me go over a few items related to logistics and format for this session. There will be a couple brief messages from the host and sponsor, after which my co-moderator, Maureen Murray, will introduce our speaker who will make her presentation. Then we'll have a question and answer session, which will be handled by Maureen. For attendees, at the bottom of your Zoom window, you will see several icons and a bar similar to what I'm showing here. Please note that chat is disabled and we are not going to use the raise hand feature, just the Q&A tool. If you have a question, click on that Q&A icon and send in your question at any time. Maureen will be monitoring the Q&A activity and asking questions on your behalf. Please note that we may not be able to get to everyone's questions. Thanks for your understanding on that. Finally, the programs in the Sunday Speaker Series are being recorded and a link to each recording will be made available on the Friends of the Village Library webpage. The Friends of the Village Library works closely with the library to sponsor educational and entertaining programs for the Cooperstown community. The annual Sunday Speaker Series is one way the group fulfills its mission. Last year's programs featured a diverse group of speakers that included author Gretchen Soren on her book, Driving While Black, Tim Johnson on establishing rural broadband in our area, and Chris Rossi and collector Gary Casanelli on the art of Keith Herring. The League of Women Voters of the Cooperstown area is grateful for this opportunity to sponsor the Friends of the Village Library Sunday Speaker Series with its goal of providing educational programming to the community. Serving the people of the Cooperstown area, including the village of Cooperstown, the towns of Otsego, Middlefield, Springfield, and Hartwick, and surrounding towns in northern Otsego County, the League believes that democracy is not a spectator sport. To find out more about your local League, please go to our website, lwvcooperstownarea.org. And now I'm going to stop my share. Um, and uh, Maureen uh, will now introduce our speaker. Uh, Maureen, if you haven't already done so, please um, start your video and unmute yourself. Well, uh, thank you very much, Leanne. It's, it's a distinct pleasure for me to introduce uh, Lucy Schaefer. Cooperstown Central School alumna and author. She will speak about her new book called School Lunch, Unpacking Our Shared Stories. Lucy grew up in Fly Creek, New York, just a couple of zip codes away and attended Yale University where she studied painting and printmaking. She spent a year teaching primary school art in Italy before moving to New York City and pursuing a career in magazines. She spent five years at Food and Wine Magazine and while there, Lucy developed a love of photography and started shooting projects on the side. She launched her full-time commercial photography business in 2007 and since then has shot over 50 cookbooks as well as many advertising campaigns and magazine stories. Her client list includes Martha Stewart Magazine, The Food Network, Starbucks, Chipotle, Campbell's, Oprah Magazine, and many others. School Lunch, Unpacking Our Shared Stories started as a personal project and grew into a book. The first where she is not only the photographer, but also the author. Lucy now lives uh, with her husband and two girls in Croton on Hudson and is thrilled to share more about school lunch with us. Uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, I want you to know that Lucy went to school with my middle son, Patrick uh, Murray. And um, if there's time, there's uh, a, a story to unpack about dinner with Lucy at the Murray household. It's also good, I think, for us to know that uh, 
Lucy engaged with many of the school classes um, under the leadership of school librarian, Emily Gibson. And she had this very nice presentation for several classes during their library time, I think. So we wanted to say uh, thank you, Emily, or as the kids would say, thank you, Mrs. Gibson. So with no further ado, I'll get uh, uh, unpictured here and uh, we'll give it right to Lucy. All right, thank you, Maureen. Thanks for that great intro. And thanks everyone for, for coming here today virtually to listen to me talk about um, my school lunch book. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I have a little, little presentation to go through here. And here we go. All right, so as Maureen said, I'm gonna be talking about my book, School Lunch, Unpacking Our Shared Stories, which came out um, just last year, this past fall. And a little bit about me, which is already Maureen covered as well, but grew up in Black Creek, Cooperstown. Afterwards, before I went to Yale, I actually was an exchange student for a year in Japan. Then I did go to Yale, studied painting and printmaking, took one photo class, but it wasn't until later that I really started focusing on that. I did teach in Italy for a year, trying to figure out what to do with my art degree, moved to New York, started working in magazines, and um, eventually went to Food and Wine magazine where I really started my interest in food photography. And after five years there, decided it was time to be the one taking the pictures and have uh, been shooting ever since. So the idea for this book um, really started, these are my kids, um, this is Georgia and Annie. And the book started when, I think it was about five years ago and it was August when it was about to be back to school back to packing lunches. And I was just thinking, what am I even gonna pack? And I was thinking about my own lunch when I was a kid. This is my old lunch box, Pigs in Space. And I would very, very often have peanut butter and jelly. And I would love, I would also get some sort of chips and I would love to just shove the chips in between the peanut butter and jelly and make a sandwich. And that was what I had pretty much every day. And I was just feeling like, how come I can't pack peanut butter and jelly? Because I don't know, those of you who have kids today uh, know that most of the schools are, are nut free these days. So you can't rely on the peanut butter um, like my parents could. There are my parents there. And I started thinking about what did they have when they were kids for school lunch. I also started thinking about my days as a Japanese exchange student and all the cute little bento boxes that my host mom would pack for me. And just started thinking again about like, what do other people have for school lunch? What can I make my kids? And then I also thought about this one intern I hired when I was at Food and Wine. And this guy was an adult, he was in his twenties and he had never had an orange. And I remember just being mind blown by how can you be an adult and never have had an orange? He came from the Midwest, uh, like normal, smart kid. Somehow it came up in conversation. Um, but he just, he had had orange juice, but he had never had an orange. And I started to think about how food and culture and identity are all sort of swirled up together in one. And it, you know, what you eat has to do with where you come from, but it also has to do with your own personal preferences and maybe some family histories. Maybe his mom didn't like oranges, we don't know. Um, and I started to ask people, I started with my neighbors, um, what did you have for school lunch? And I, you know, at the time we were in Brooklyn and there's so much great community in Brooklyn. I was really surprised coming from Cooperstown, coming from Fly Creek, how small town it felt living in Brooklyn. Um, on the left here is the Mangal family. And this little girl was going in the middle, was going to school with my daughter at the time. And they were of Puerto Rican descent. And I was wondering, you know, what did they have? What, what did a Puerto Rican school lunch look like? Um, and on the right, that's Sammy who ran Sammy's Market, which was our corner store. And growing up in Fly Creek, our corner store was always known to us as Offie's um, because it was run by Offie. And so that's what you called it. And the same as uh, in Brooklyn, it was Sammy's because this is Sammy and he ran the corner store, the bodega. Um, 
but I started to think more about Sammy and I actually didn't even know where he was from. I mean, I guess just looking at him, I figured he was Middle Eastern. Uh, I wasn't sure, um, but I started to wonder what did he have for school lunch? I thought about people I knew from work. This girl is named Zana. She grew up in Kazakhstan and she worked for me as a photo assistant occasionally. You know, there's also this guy who's Norwegian and a stylist and an art director I worked with. And the, the photo industry is just filled with a lot of international people. And of course, New York City is filled with a lot of international people. I also, as a commercial photographer, had the, the pleasure of shooting celebrities for work. And this was Padma Lakshmi that I shot for the Wall Street Journal. This is Jacques Pepin, who I shot for Rachel Ray magazine. I started wondering, what did they have for school lunch? Would they tell me? Um, and then even just family and friends. This is a Cooperstown resident. This is Anna Gret, and she grew up in Germany. This is my father-in-law, Hua Sung Lee, and he grew up in Korea. And this is my college roommate's um, aunt, and she grew up in a wealthy family in Iran. So really just from the start, from my own personal network, I had a lot of people that I could start asking, um, what did you have for school lunch? Um, I'm just gonna back up and I am going to tell you their stories. I'm not gonna leave you hanging on a lot of those stories, but I want to back up for a second to talk a little bit about food photography in general. And the idea of what is a food stylist and what is a prop stylist and what is this world that I'm in? Um, because there's, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about things. A lot of people ask me, is the food plastic? Is that, you know, there was a lot, everybody seems to know about how they used glue and advertising for milk in the cereal. And while there is some truth to that, uh, a lot of that is sort of dated to earlier food photography and food photography of today is really, you know, it's really about the real food. And this is some of my commercial work and everything is edible. Everything is the real food, the recipe. That said, like every single little grain of rice on that burrito was considered. Every single little sauce strip, the fact that this tomato fell off the side is not an accident. That was, there was a lot of conversation about should it fall off, should it not fall off. So um, this is kind of the world I was coming from. Um, for a burger like this, the food stylist, while they wouldn't use glue or anything not edible, they definitely would have a little heat gun. They'd have toothpicks, they'd have, tons of burger patties that they were picking through to find the best one. They would have a paintbrush to paint um, little grease on and, um, and all of that. So they're definitely tricks to the business to making that all look delicious. Um, and then prop stylist, this is Martha Burnaby, who is actually super important to the book because she's the prop stylist that I collaborated with on a lot of these stories. And she's also one of the book's subjects. So we'll get to her story. But you know, the prop stylist, their job is for a photo shoot, they bring everything that's not the food. So they bring all the forks, the plates, the knives, the surfaces. This picture of Martha shows her actually in um, her prop house. She owns a prop house in Manhattan where you can go in. It's a super fun place, so fun. You can go in and just basically rent everything from, you can see globes to lamps, to chairs, to tables, to little statues, old games, just everything you need for your shoot. So. This is sort of the world I'm coming from when I start my school lunch project. But the difference is with school lunch and with this personal project, I didn't want it to just be delicious. I wasn't shooting for Chipotle. I wasn't shooting for Starbucks. I was shooting for myself. And part of what's part, it's not all of what school lunch is about, but part of it is about kind of the grossness. It's not necessarily the most delicious. Um, I'm going to read actually, this is a, an image from. Michaela Walker's lunch. And um, she actually is a friend of mine. She grew up in New York. She was born in 1976. And I'll just read a little excerpt from her story. I love my mom, but she's a horrible cook. I ate the same damn thing every day for six years, peanut butter and jelly, an apple and apple juice. My mom hated cooking and resented having to pack lunches. I don't know if it occurred to her to give me something different. She also had this thing about putting butter under the jelly, which I thought was disgusting, but she maintained you had to do or the jelly would leak through. We'd have this constant battle. I really wanted my sandwiches cut down the middle, but she thought they should be cut diagonally. So that's how she did it. 
now that I look back on it, you'd think she could have thrown me a bone. So I had a lot of fun working with a food stylist and prop stylist to make this shot where we just made it, you know, embrace the apple going brown. We took the apple and we smooshed it into the sandwich and it was fun. It was a lot of fun. We left the crust. So uh, that was part of the project that, that I really enjoyed from the get-go. This is actually Martha Burnaby, who I showed you, the prop stylist. This is her lunch. And again, this was a very gross one. And this was super fun um, <laughs> to build and to shoot. And let me just explain what you're looking at here. Uh, she grew up in Great Falls, Virginia. One day in fourth grade, Mr. Cole, our science teacher, took the garbage out of the lunchroom garbage can. When we arrived to science class, which was right after lunch, he had a big tarp spread on the floor. He had us all sit in a circle on the edge of the tarp, the same area we'd sit to dissect a sand shark and do other science experiments. He dumped the whole bag of garbage onto the tarp and started sorting through it. He pointed out what could have been composted or recycled and what was perfectly good unfinished food. He even ate some of it. So I'll stop there, but you get the idea. And, and this was, again, super fun to shoot. And this, this is the end of the gross ones, but this also is a story from someone I know. Her name is Elizabeth Bennett, and she grew up in Tennessee. And she described her lunchroom as having very typically to a lot of people's experience, sort of groups and cliques, and you'd sit with different people. And her kind of family or her place was the gross out table. And what they did at the gross out table, I'll put in her words right here. Gross out table food challenges would involve mixing cafeteria food with foods from home and then daring each other to eat it. Ranch dressing mixed with applesauce and chocolate sauce poured over pizza. Wildflowers dug up from home and top of a hamburger. The boys were grosser than the girls because they'd involve bugs, which I would never eat. They'd put worms and bugs and stuff, but I'd be out at that point. The funny thing is that every single one of those kids from the gross out table went on to careers as natural scientists or anthropologists. We all became world travelers and social activists. I'm not sure if it was the experimentation or the conversation, but there was something that took place at that run lunchroom table during those formative years that put us all on non-traditional paths. I'd also like to point out for the librarians in the group that um, Beth Bennett did grow up to be a librarian as well. Um, so this actually put us over the line a little bit. Um, the food stylist, Chris, went, went above and beyond. He got some freeze-dried cricket, crickets sorry, and some real worms. And we were having really fun making this picture until we all actually started feeling queasy and we, we had to move on. But um, it wasn't all about just finding gross stories. Um, it was really important to us with the styling to stay, stay true to the story. Um, and we were conscious at all points that we were dealing with someone's real memories. And in my interviews with everyone, I asked really specific questions like if they said their food was packaged um, you know, if they said they brought carrot sticks, I would say, did it come in a Tupperware? Did it come in a Ziploc bag or a full top bag? And how was it dried out? Was it fresh? Did you like it? You know, I asked a lot of specific questions so that we could really stay true to everybody's story. So here's Farishta again, who I showed you in the beginning, who is the aunt of my college roommates. And her story, I'm going to read to you. Um, keep in mind, she was born 1944 in Tehran. Um, Iran, and this is her story. I went to a private school with a two to three hour break between morning and afternoon sessions. Our nanny would come pick me up at noon every day and we'd walk home. My father would come home from work as well and we'd all have a full hot lunch. My favorite dish was gourmet sebzi, stew with lamb and greens. And like most Persian stews, it would cook for hours. At home, my favorite aromas would fill the air. Aromatic parsley, fenugreek, dill, fried onions, dark red sour cherries, different rices, chicken. At break, some families would send nannies or chauffeurs to drop off stacked metal containers full of hot meals from home. The aroma of the food the drivers would bring was so amazing. I wanted my lunch to smell like that. I would plead with my mom to send food, but she preferred I come home. Once in a blue moon, if I cried my eyes out, she would let me have lunch at school. So making this dish, this is actually, this is Persian food here on the right. And it's the dish she describes. And 
I don't know how many of you have, have eaten Persian food or cooked Persian food, but getting this perfect crust on the top of that rice is really hard. And it was really important to me and the food stylist that we got it right. So I just wanted to share this kind of funny behind the scenes video clip of us in the kitchen um, making this. All right, I'm ready. Do you want me to walk in? Yeah, that's a good idea. Nice. That looks good. That makes me happy. <laughs> this makes me very happy. <laughs> this is scary. See, you get the idea. Um, this was a moment of triumph for us that we had kind of gotten that food right. All right, I'm ready. Let me skip here. And then um, along those lines of uh, getting the food right, this is another person that I knew before I asked about their lunch. Her name is Aya Ogawa. And I asked her about her lunch because shes I knew she was born in Japan. And I, again, was thinking of my Japanese host moms and those cute little bento boxes they made. And I thought that was what Aya was going to tell me about. But again, this was one of these surprises where school lunch isn't just about your cultural heritage. It's also about your family and the unique um, circumstances or personalities um, involved that don't necessarily have to do with your culture as a whole. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read her story. I was born in Tokyo, but my family moved to Texas and then Georgia for a few years before we returned to Japan for my grade school. In the United States, I acquired a taste for bologna. Back in Japan, my earliest school lunches were bologna on white bread with mayo with crusts cut off. Our name, Ogawa, is written with two different kanji and means small river. My mom would cut my bologna sandwiches into little kanji rectangles that would spell this out. Our school had a huge storage closet full of instant noodles in case of national emergency. Tragedy never struck, but the packages had expiration dates. So once a year, they would cook it up for the students. We never knew in advance when yakisoba day would be, but we all really looked forward to it. So I was just delighted with the surprise of, this is um, the kanji spelled out here for Ogawa. And I never would have guessed that that would be somebody's Japanese lunch. Um, and I also just love the story of the the emergency ramen closet. And, uh, and this is also an example of getting, getting all of the little details right. This specific brand and specific noodle, I went back and forth with Aya to get the one she remembered. And I actually purchased this from Japan and had it shipped for the shoot. So a little, getting all those little details just right was super important to me. I have a little behind the scenes, again, of me and Chris Barsh in the studio. Um, so you can see. He's applying some of that mayo with a paintbrush. So yes, for the props for the book, I was on Etsy, I was on eBay, I was renting things, buying things, sourcing from all over, trying to get as accurate of the props as I could. For Padma Lakshmi, I actually recorded how this came wrapped. It came all the way from India and I just love the packaging. Um, I thought that was super cool. And that's how her lunch was all packed up. She talks in her profile about how she grew up part of the time in India and part of the time in New York City. And she had the same lunch in both places. And it was this idalis and this chutney and it was delicious and she loved it. And she remembers everybody else around her just having these bologna sandwiches, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and making fun of her Indian food and saying how it smelled. And this was in New York, obviously in India, there was no reaction because she was eating the same thing that everybody else was eating. 
Um, but when she was in New York, she remembers feeling conflicted because there was partly a feeling of shame that people were mocking her food, partly a feeling of defiance, like, well, this food is better. And I think that's ultimately what was the stronger feeling is that she really didn't want that American peanut butter and jelly. It just didn't look good to her. Um, and she says to this day, she doesn't really like sandwiches. Um, so then after a while, after doing these interviews and collecting these stories, and like I said, I got pretty far um, in the diversity of just my friends and family and friends of friends and people I knew from work. But at a certain point, I really wanted to go outside of my network, somebody who I would never meet ordinarily, what would they have for lunch? So I decided one very hot August um, summer day to set up a portrait pop-up booth in Union Square in New York City. And I basically, you can see this is me. Um, and this is this little booth I made. And I, I just had a couple of friends with clipboards and questionnaires and basically offered people free portraits if they told me their story of their lunch and they signed a model release saying I could use the story in my project. Um, at this point, I didn't even have it as a book necessarily. I was still just gathering information to see what I was gonna do with it. And I was really nervous about this. Um, I just thought, uh, are we going to be those kind of people with clipboards that everybody just rushes by and doesn't want to stop? Or is anybody going to even stop? Um, but I, I shot over 80 portraits that day. And I did really get outside of my network. I got people who were homeless. I got people who were tourists who were just traveling, passing through Union Square. I got people on their lunch break all ages, all backgrounds, and it was super fun. Um, from those 80, I think I put 11 in the book. So, uh, you know, across the, basically across this whole project, I interviewed a lot more people than I actually ended up curating in the end into the, into the book itself. But still, it was a super fun day. And those 11 that I got to from that um, was really, was a really great group. Um, the next thing I started thinking about was specific things I wanted. I wanted somebody who grew up in a circus. What did they have for lunch? I was thinking, what about an Orthodox rabbi? What, what would they have? Um, basically, anybody had school lunch. So I just started, you know, a Somali refugee resettled in Minneapolis. I think I had read an article about it. And so then started thinking, um, you know, somebody who was homeschooled back when homeschooling is before the pandemic, when it was a novelty. Um, and then just more celebrities, like really I could ask anybody because everybody was fair game. Everybody has had school lunch. So um, George Foreman, I wanna talk about, he's, he's in the book and I wanna talk about him and I'm gonna play a little bit of his audio of him talking in his own words. But I also just wanted to share a little of the background. I, I, I knew in advance he had a great story because I have a friend who's a writer who had interviewed him for Esquire, who told me a little bit about his background and he knew he would be great for the book. So I tried basically for two years, I'm gonna just hit play on this over here because this is me. Okay, starts in February, 2019. Hi, me checking in, you know, who would you wanna be in this book? And this is after we've had one email exchange where he said he would do it. And then, you know, nobody's answering me. This is all me, it's March. Uh, just checking in, just checking in. And I just had to keep at this. I mean, a certain point I'm like, am I spamming him? He hasn't replied, but he said he wanted to do it. Um, this goes on, this goes on and on. And then eventually he does write back every now and then he writes back, he's going to do it. And then there'll be more for me. Like, and it kind of went on like this, where it would be a whole lot for me and every now and then one from him. Um, but eventually it came together and, and we did it. And I wanna go ahead and share, um, I recorded the audio for all of my interviews, which sort of helped me when I was taking notes. And in his case, let me go to the next slide here. And in his case, it was, it was actually really great because his story was so great, and I just love that I have um, the recording of him actually telling it. So I'm going to press play on this, and just so you know, the images that you'll see are a combination of ones I shot for him, 
And it sort of shows, obviously, you know, I flew to Texas, I met with him there and it shows him in his, um, he has a big mansion and he's obviously super successful and rich at this point, but he talks about his um, beginnings being really poor and not having much at all. So I'm gonna hit play here. I was thinking the day when my son told me about the uh, conversation, how hunger really shapes violence. Violence mm -hmm. is all built around hunger. Uh, some of my happiest days I can remember now as a kid were the day, days I just finished eating and it meant I could play all day and jump and run and have fun. But those days uh, didn't have much food. There was always a fight or a reason to start a fight or finish a fight or something like that. And yeah. Grow, yeah, and that's a fact about hunger. I, not, I didn't realize that until he asked me to talk about it again today. Yeah how, much, yeah, how much violence was built around pure hunger and so much joy was built around uh, having a tasty meal. It's all about wow. playing. Once, once you had a meal, it was all about playing and ice cream and cake, jumping, yeah. and turning flips and all of that. So going to school, I didn't have a good time. I was always hungry. Was, mm. Even on a good day growing up, there was only one meal. There was only going to be one meal because my mom had to get up early and go to work. And it was, uh, uh, she ran the house because my dad and mom broke up pretty early. Mm -hmm. And then and coming home from school, uh, that was the time there would be a meal. Okay. And, uh, and that meal was, was going to have to last you until the next day. <laughs> <laughs> next day wow. at the same time. So occasionally something bright would happen. That would be a, a, a lunch. We take a lunch to school. Thin, paper thin slice of lunch meat. Mm -hmm. And between two pieces of uh, sandwich bread. And that was so, it was just something that was so, you just didn't see it so seldom that you'd always complain because there wouldn't be any mayonnaise or mustard or anything like that to put on the bread. Mm -hmm. but you, the old thing is you can't have it all. You know? Right, 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 right. Yeah, so I used yeah. to dream about a little mayo. Then sometimes you walk in the house and someone would have a half a jar of mayo, but there wasn't any sign of bread or lunch meat. <laughs> Oh wow. So, wow! And so, but and so, a lot of times it's embarrassing. I don't know how a person can be so deprived and poor and then have so much pride. So there'd be a, a bag around with stains of grease on the back. Maybe someone went to the store or something, and I blow it up and carry it with me. And so at lunchtime, most of the kids we have lunch in our room sometimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have to put our lunch bag up so that we can take it to lunchtime. And I'd have a fake bag wow. with me carrying it to school so the kids didn't know that I didn't have a lunch. And that would, third grade is when you start looking around and trying to make yourself handsome and good looking uh -huh. <laughs> and trying to conceal that you didn't have anything. So it was about the third grade I started. And, oh, I already had my lunch, or I ate it on the way to school, those kinds of things. And that's right. why I would put, blow the bag up and then eventually fold it up like, oh, I ate it already. And that's wow. the, a bag was precious because you needed it, you really needed it again. So you couldn't just throw it away as they did their bag. And so then you go into the lunchroom, and uh, all the kids had, there was 26 cents, I think. All the kids would pay, and they'd have uh, maybe two veggies, a piece of bread, and, a, and some meat. And that was a beautiful sight to see it. And I never had one of those. I never had one. And another, wow. uh, you get a, a little cup of milk with it. Mm -hmm. And I always wished I could have one. And I went to school all through elementary school never having one. Never wow. having one that uh, thing of milk and uh, thinking the milk was six cents 
and I never had one. So um, in case that audio didn't come through, I'm sorry, the quality wasn't the best. Um, he didn't have anything for school lunch and he would take an empty paper bag and blow it up to hide that fact. And I just found that so heartbreaking. Um, he went on to talk about how um, you know, his sisters dropped out of school and then he dropped out of school and he would, I think he made it a, a half a year before his mom realized he had dropped out because he would leave every morning, go like he was going to school, go through the backwoods and like jump in his open bedroom window and go back to bed. Um, and he said he dropped out because he didn't, he didn't have clean clothes. He didn't have food and it was um, not worth it. It was like too much for him as a kid. So it's, heartbreaking and it, it's also just I think super important or it was important for me to me to include stories like that in this book because not everybody is joking around about the bad cafeteria food you know there's people who can't have any lunch and that's part of the reason why sort of the free lunch programs and the national lunch programs are I think so important thank you um sorry So uh, back to Sammy at the corner store. Um, so I am going to skip to his story. He grew up in Jerusalem, I learned when I started talking to him. And he um, talked about how he would steal other kids' lunches when he was in school. And let's see, I guess the typical lunch is what you see here. It was falafel that's like what everybody had and you could get it with hot sauce or without hot sauce but there really wasn't a lot of variation with what what you could get um but then people who had access to the foreign embassies could get this peanut butter and jelly so i'm just going to read a little bit from his sometimes my friend and i would steal other kids lunches we only robbed the rich kids not the ones like us two kids in my class had fathers who worked for the foreign embassies one german and one french their parents shopped at the supermarket on the base, so they had fancy lunches. This one rich, selfish guy would tease us with his lunch, saying we didn't know what peanut butter was, which we didn't. So we'd try to rob him to try it. My friend go, would go up and talk to him, and I'd sneak back and take the lunch out of his bag. Peanut butter and white bread sliced, white sliced bread tasted really good. Our teacher knew my friend and I stole lunches. One time he caught us eating a bologna sandwich on white sliced bread. He asked it where we got it, and I said my mom. He laughed. We all knew that kind of food is what the rich kids eat. Most of us had pita or country bread. We never admitted to stealing it, but he knew. And then back to, again, from the beginning, I showed the picture of our friends and neighbors, the Mangual family. And um, this is Josephine. She grew up in New York. Um, she was born in 1954. She grew up in New York City, and she was the first of her family to be in the city. Everybody else, her, her mom was Puerto Rican, and they were part of a very strong Puerto Rican network. And I'm just going to read a little bit uh, that explains the lunch picture you see there. I grew up in a Black and Puerto Rican neighborhood in Harlem. Puerto Ricans don't eat cold lunch, so my mom and a small group of other Puerto Rican mothers would bring us piping hot food and fiambreras, stacked tins every day. They weren't allowed into school, so we wouldn't eat during the lunchtime in the cafeteria. Instead, we'd wait and eat at recess. That's when our mothers would meet us in the schoolyard with our hot food. My mother always brought extra because everyone loved her cooking and would flock around us. She'd bring platanos, rice, beans, and sometimes some meat and a fork from home. She'd also always have dessert usually limbers, which are like fruit popsicles. It was a social time for the mothers too. Everyone enjoyed it. I just love the story. I love the idea of, of the these group of kids like not actually eating during lunch and just waiting for their moms to meet them at the playground and, and all of the non-Puerto Ricans also coming over because they wanted the food. Um, I think it's just a fun story. Uh, interestingly enough, this is a, a picture of her daughter's lunch. So Josephine's daughter, um, also grew up in New York, but by the time it was one generation down, she wasn't making homemade Puerto Rican food and delivering it to the playground. She had her daughter just get the cafeteria food. 
So, you know, I love these multi-generational stories and these stories of change and assimilation and um, different cultures kind of melding together. So, and also this lunch is very familiar to what I remember. Similar lunches um, growing up in Cooperstown definitely had the uh, pizza on Fridays and the veggies I remember similar to this. Um, circling back to Jacques Pepin, um, unlike George Foreman, so Jacques is also, you know, a celebrity, just a world-renowned chef and very influential. I wasn't sure if he would agree to be in the book either. I had a connection from that story that I, I mentioned, the Rachel Ray story I had shot. And um, so I reached out to his PR person. And unlike the George Foreman, where I chased him for two years, all of a sudden I get a phone call on my cell phone from Jacques and I'm not ready. I don't have my recording thing. I'm, I don't have any paper, but I'm not going to ask him to call me back. So I just grabbed a scrap of um, whatever I could find on the table and, and took notes quickly. Um, and again, this is another one I was surprised at because I was expecting, okay, he's a famous French chef. It's going to be like the most delicious food, but he grew up in wartime and uh, that really you know, influenced his lunch. So I'm gonna read a little bit from Jacques. Uh, he was from Bourg, France, and he was born in 1935. During the war, no one had any money and lunch was terrible. From ages five to seven, I went to a Jesuit school. I'm not even gonna to try to do his French accent. And I do wish I had recorded it so you could hear, hear his words, but you'll have to do with me reading it. They took me early because my father had joined the resistance and my mother couldn't take care of me. They used to serve us a kind of bread made from whatever flour they could find. It was hard as a rock, dry and full of bugs. The older boys taught me to bang it on the table and wait for the bugs to come out before trying to eat it. The priests also served a liquid porridge gruel that was inedible. They were really tough and forced us to eat it all. We were starving, but it was so disgusting that kids would sometimes try to hide in their pockets. I came from the town, but two thirds of the kids came from local farms. They were the lucky ones. They would come to school with a jar of duck fat or honey or jam from their farms. Guys like me would try to barter to get a little bit of it for our bread. I remember one time I begged one kid for some salted pork fat from his jar and he gave it to me. Then I got an idea. I turned the bread over and asked another kid for some of his jam on the other side. I was delighted when that worked. The taste didn't go together, but I didn't care. So I just love that. I love that he's, um, his beginnings are an old piece of bread that you had to bang the bugs out of with duck fat on one side and jam on the other um, and where he ended up with his life later. And here back to our uh, Cooperstown resident, Anna Gret. Um, let me go to her story. Let's see here. Anna Gret also um, grew up in a similar time, Oop. here we go, uh, as Jacques, um, she was born in Dresseldorf, Germany in 1934. So the interesting thing about Anna Gretz's lunch is that it spanned basically, she was in Germany during and after World War II. So her lunch really changed. Um, let me just click the image up here and this top plate right here is sort of, and this school photo right here is kind of um, her earliest memory. And then down here is what it evolved to a little bit later. And her story in the book is, is quite lengthy, but I'm gonna read just a little bit of it um, because I love it a lot. I grew up during the war. We'd go to school from 7 a.m. till noon. At 10 o'clock, we'd get a piece of Schwartzberg black bread with a little lard spread on it and sugar sprinkled on top. At noontime, when you went home, the big main meal was on the table. Everyone lived exactly the same way from the land. We had chickens and pigs and ducks on our land and we grew and canned everything. You didn't go to the store for anything but sugar. My mother was home with seven little girls. All the men were gone at the war, so it was just the grandfathers, kids, and women. After lunch, we'd work in the fields. In the fall, we'd do the threshing and cut the grain. A lot of grain would fall off during that process, so the kids would take baskets and collect rye grains, and the mothers would roast and make coffee out of it. We didn't waste anything. 
We made our own sausage with a hand grinder and intestines. We'd bring them to a smokehouse and pick them up a few days later. We had to schlep water from the pump to the house for every drop we needed for washing and cooking. To drink, we'd have two buckets of fresh water with a ladle we all shared, but everyone was always healthy. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. And she talks about her dad actually, um, and the experience of her dad coming back from the war. My dad was a shoemaker, so he was one of the first to be drafted for the war because they needed someone to fix boots for the soldiers. Three days before the war, my dad was in Hamburg. An officer brought three of them overalls and told them to change out of their uniforms and go home, that it was about to be all over. My dad came home and we didn't even know he was in the house. My mom hid him in the attic and told me I couldn't go up there to use the sewing room because of the rats. I only learned he was home on the day the British came when he came out of the house with his hands up. They took him away, but he was back in two weeks because he hadn't done anything wrong. I'll never forget that. It was wonderful when the British came. I was 11 in 1945. The Brits treated us really well. They came every day to the school with a soup wagon. We had 1,000 refugees that all came up after the war, so the population of our town more than doubled. I went from sharing a bed with my sister to sharing a bed with my sister and Maria, the refugee. So I think that's such a powerful story. And also, again, an example of how when I started to talk to people for this book, and on the one hand, they're talking about lunch, and the other hand, they're talking about so much more. And they're talking about what's going on in their lives and in their childhood. Um, Anna Gret showed me this book she had. So this is the early class. And then here's it later after the war, when you can see the population is doubled. Um, and it looks a lot more formal. Um, not all of the stories, I'm gonna just end up, I wanna leave some time for questions. So I'm just gonna quickly tell you about two more quickly here because they were also a lot of lighthearted stories that I came across. Um, this one I won't read, I'll just tell you, this is Daniela Perez. She grew up in Venezuela and basically she, this is these little pictures here on the right are pictures of her brother when, and that's her brother that she's covering his face as an adult. And she used to sell, sell his picture because he was really cute. And she, there were a lot of girls in her school who thought he was super cute. So she would sell pictures of him so that she could buy junk food from the cafeteria. Her mom every day would pack her a really healthy lunch and wouldn't want her to get the junk food. So she would sell these colored pencils that her mom would bring home from work trips to New York. And she would sell little pictures of her brother so that she could have the cafeteria lunch on top of her mother's lunch. And these, you know, these chococitos were the cookies she talked about. I was able to find those on Amazon and they're delicious. Um, so I thought that was a really funny story. Uh, and lastly, um, this is a friend of mine, Anna, who grew up in Jordan. And um, she has a great story that talks a lot about the, the food and growing up in that country. And, um, but one thing that stood out in her mind was the kids always used to buy chocolate and um, it was very expensive to get this chocolate right here that you can see on the right of the picture, apparently was more pocket money than most people had. But she had this one friend, Rima, who got enough pocket money to buy a whole one of those every day. And because it came in sections and there were a bunch of friends, the friends would line up and it would expect Rima to share it with them every day. And she did because it's a, it's a country where hospitality and food sharing is definitely good manners. Um, but Anna said there was one historic day where Rima just snapped and unwrapped the thing and licked the whole thing and said, I am not sharing. And the rest of the kids were kind of floored. They hadn't realized that um, Rima didn't want to share. And that was the day that she didn't. So I think that's it for me. Um, thank you so much for letting me share all these stories. And there's a lot more I could go on and on. I love every single story in the book. People ask me what's my favorite and it's hard to pick. So I guess uh, Maureen, if you want to open it to questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, Lucy, that was such a great uh, presentation, so full of color and, and, and interesting stories. What a gift to Thank you. our society that you've collected them. 
Um, I want to just remind everyone that um, you should use the Q&A function to put your questions in. We've got a few. Um, I'll start out with uh, the first question that came in. Uh, which story had the most impact on you as the writer photographer? I, I think it was definitely that George Foreman, the just the image of a, you know, a kid who only gets one meal a day, if that on some days, and that um, blew up an empty bag and brought it to school. And I asked him in the interview, were other kids throwing away food? Did you ever like ask for food? And and he said, yeah, every day, everybody would like eat half a sandwich and, and chuck it, but that he would never, ever ask for that food or take that food because of the pride. And I just, I was very moved by that. And I was moved by him telling me that, um, you know, violence is built around hunger. It's like, would, would he become a famous boxer if he wasn't so hungry? Maybe not. Mm. Um, and, you know, also I didn't talk about his story, but Marcus Samuelson, who's a famous chef for those of you who know different chefs he grew up in sweden um and he was really influenced by school lunch as well it just i guess the stories that resonated with me were the ones that where the people were like yes school lunch really meant a lot to me and, and here's why mm -hmm. good good thanks and of course we see the beautiful outcome but clearly there was a whole lot of work to um, get to that outcome. And uh, this question asks, what was the most challenging aspect of putting together these collected stories? Um, I guess there were a lot of challenges along the way. I think in the beginning, before I had a publisher, it was just the challenge of finding the time and money to do it. It was, was you know, just with Martha and Chris, the food and prop stylist that I collaborated with for a lot of them, you know, we had full-time jobs. So it was like, when is everybody free and when can we do these and how many can we do? Um, it was super fun, but I guess finding the time to do them was tricky. And then once I did have a book deal, um, I felt the weight of like, well, who am I leaving out? And, you know, who do I need? At one point, my editor said, you know, nobody else has a, a list like you do that they're going to say, oh, you didn't have a you know, daughter of an alcoholic in your story, which I did have. But um, <laughs> uh, so I think just try, I really felt the pressure of if I'm telling this story that's meant to be, okay, universal, but also unique stories, I really wanted to make sure I was um, including a diverse amount of people's stories in it. So I guess that was a challenge, but also just well, maybe not the most difficult thing, but something that I was always keeping at the forefront. Mm -hmm. And I think you've succeeded. Uh, Thank you. The, the diversity. Um, Bill, Bill asks, um, first, uh, like who packs your household school lunches and what would the consumers of those lunches write about them? Well, the consumers may be watching this Zoom from upstairs, my kids. So um, they, we've settled. I actually got a lot of ideas from this book. Um, things like rice balls. Uh, I often am the one who packs lunches. Sometimes my husband does, but more often than not, it's, it's me. Um, the kids also, I print out the school cafeteria menu and they circle the days that they'll eat that, you know, so they always eat the pizza Friday lunch at school. Um, we also, I love going to H Mart, which is an Asian grocery store and we get steamed buns, steamed pork buns, and I'll heat those up and put them in a thermos. Um, I think I remembered by doing this book, there were lots of different people having different kinds of soup. And I was like, oh, soup. And I, you know, so that's a Campbell's soup reheated and put in a thermos is a common lunch. So yeah, I don't do peanut butter and jelly for them, but um, have found a lot of, a lot of other good staples. I still don't love making lunches, but um, so every time they say they'll eat the school lunch, whatever the school is serving, I'm always happy about that. <laughs> Good, good. Have your daughters written or your husband, have they written any story about what, how they perceive your lunches? No, I, we should ask them to. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. It could be a homework assignment. <laughs> yeah. Um, Joan says, it's not so much a question, but thank you so much for your presentation. Interesting and original. So I wanted you to know that. Thank you. Um, I noticed in terms of the diversity and what you prepped us on in terms of uh, 
I don't know if it's the stylizing or what, but um, also reflecting the diversity, I noticed that um, Jacques Pepin's story, uh, his lunch during the war was placed on um, wooden, wooden boards um, that looked very rustic. And so uh, there, you had various surfaces for the lunches and you that looks as if you thought about it. And how did you uh, acquire definitely. that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that was um, a sort of a collaboration with Martha Burnaby, the prop stylist, because we did often shoot in her prop house. Um, so had the benefit of like pulling anything we needed from there. Um, or in some cases, like this last story from Jordan, I actually just did this on my own and I, I went on site to Anna's house and that's her um, back deck stone, you know? So it's a combination of what was available that I felt would work and what Martha had and what I brought. But yeah, the, the surfaces that everything was on was a super important to me to make it sort of be a reflection of the story that was being told. Um, I'll give a reminder to everyone to please put your questions on the Q&A and uh, until we get another one, I'll, I'll unpack a lunch, it's not a lunch story, a dinner story where, Lucy, you may not have any memory of this. I'm very curious I, from your intro, what you were gonna but say. But you showed up uh, at our door with Patrick, your classmate, my son, on the uh, evening of a, of a school play. And uh, he opened the door and said, okay, if Lucy stays for dinner. And I said, sure, Lucy, we're having uh, frankfurters and beans. Um, okay, I'm not proud of it, but it was <laughs> a dinner that my family loved. It was quick and easy. And we were going to the school place. So it was very short. You announced that you were a vegetarian. So I quick made a grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> That's not the story. The story- Sorry is about that. <laughs> No problem. Um, so I have three sons and a boy husband, of course. And so this was a very testosterone heavy household. And so we're having we're having dinner and the conversation is, a, you know, going just fine. And uh, suddenly there is the question from you. Well, how do you feel about it? And I whipped around because the boys said, that's a chick question. So <laughs> my, my very male heavy household didn't talk about emotions or feelings, but I was delighted to have you inserted in um, oh, good. Our <laughs> that evening. Do you have any recollection of it? I don't, I, but I have a really <laughs> bad memory. So I love when people know me and tell me stories from my past because I'm like, oh, tell me more. <laughs> That's great. That's yeah. great. And the, and my vegetarian phase. So my parents are vegetarian. I grew up in a vegetarian household, but my own vegetarianism was a bit short lived. Um, uh -huh. When I went to Japan, I dropped it because I wanted to try all the new foods. And then I never really um, picked it up again. But <laughs> it's a, I, I, I love that story. Um, yeah. Okay, I there's uh, I don't see another question. So, but I have I have uh, another question that might reflect uh, people's interests. Um, as you as you look back at your growing up, um, uh, grade school, high school, can you think of anything that put you on this trajectory of uh, valuing oral oral stories? Um, oral history, uh, uh, stories from below, you know, from the people. Uh, can you cite um, anything that you might have experienced? Um, I'm not sure. I think I've always loved stories. I mean, in general, I was a big reader and um, writer as well. I used to write these long, like weird stories wow. when I was a kid and, um, I think I was equally, I kind of went in an art career direction, um, fine art and then commercial art. But um, when I first was in college, I was trying to make my own major. They talked me out of it, but I was trying to make a combination English um, art major because I just wanted it to be like, I was calling it words and pictures or something like that. Like I've always wanted 
to bring those two things together. And I think why I wasn't hooked with photography earlier is when I was at Yale, it was very fine art focused. Commercial art was like, you don't do that. You know, so it's very fine art, art for art's sake, which is great, but it's not what I wanted to do because it just seemed too like in a museum, who's gonna see it? Um, I was always very interested in like, what are people really looking at, talking about? Um, so that's why I loved commercial photography because it was, you know, a magazine story. It's as much the pictures and the words and you need both. So um, I don't know if how that started in, in Cooperstown, but it is something I, I've sort of always felt. I also really, um, I used to do illustration and things and I've always loved picture books when I was a kid. So I guess it's just something that's always mm -hmm. been important to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, what about if, if at all, your uh, experience in Italy and Japan as a developing young woman might have uh, prompted uh, the amazing diversity you pulled together for this book? Yeah, I mean, that was a definitely reactionary from growing up in a small town. And I think Cooperstown, I love that I grew up there and I, it was amazing, especially as a, a younger kid. But when you get to high school, like you ask anybody who went to high school in Cooperstown, you start to feel like, oh, I got to get out of here. It's so small. I got to see the world. And I just, that's why I went to Japan. I was like, I got to go someplace really far, really different. I got to see some things. Um, and I've always been interested in travel. I've traveled a lot, um, interested in different cultures and have tried to make friends with people who have different backgrounds from my own because I, I'm just genuinely interested um, in that. I think that's also why I ended up um, in New York City because it's, it's just such a melting pot, obviously. Sure, sure, sure. We do have a late question coming in. This will have to be the last one uh, from Judy. Uh, uh, you illustrated a children's book about a tomato war, correct? That's Tell correct, yes. That. that was called The Guest Who Threw Tomatoes. And, and actually the writer of that book was Cal Fussman. And Cal Fussman is the writer who I mentioned knew the inside scoop about George Foreman having a blown up a lunch bag and been too poor. So that was, um, he was a, a writer friend of, um, Actually, for those of you who might know Wendy Littlefield from the Van Bergen de Wolf and later the Brewery Oma Gang um, family, she was, I worked for them as like my first job. I was an intern with them and they were just great people to know and put me in touch with Cal who needed an illustrator. And yes, I did. And that story was about, actually about cultural exchange as well. It was kind of, um, Pepe who's throwing tomatoes at these kids because it's what they do in Spain and some food festival in Spain and kind of a funny way to teach about different food traditions. So it, it's not totally unrelated actually. Good, good, good. Well, Lucy, it's been a, it's been a great uh, adventure uh, walking along your journey with you. And I think you've enhanced um, our understanding of cultures and uh, those of us who are packing school lunches, it's long gone from my life now, but um, looking at our school lunches maybe a little differently. So thank you so much. It's been a, a, an absolute pleasure to have you and thank you for um, uh, those uh, asking any questions. I'm gonna turn um, our program over to uh, Leanne who has some closing remarks. Hi, um, yes, um, thank you, Lucy and Maureen for um, just a great program today. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen just to tell you about some events coming up in the next two months. So give me a second here, bring that up. And okay, so, um, on uh, March 15 is election day for the for the village of Cooperstown, and and while the offices up for election are are uncontested, just please get out there and show your civic pride by voting. Um, that's a little League of Women Voters uh, message for you. Um, now, uh, after 10 programs presented on Zoom during the pandemic, Friends of the Village Library is pleased to present its Sunday speaker program live 
at the Village Hall in Cooperstown on March 20 um, with Phoebe Schreiner, Executive Director of the Center for Agricultural Development and Entrepreneurship. She'll speak on the topic, New York State, the next food shed. She will discuss the activities of the center and the future of agriculture in New York State, examined in light of changing demographics and climate change. On April 24, Bob Rosenthal, poet, memoirist, and secretary to poet Alec, Allen Ginsberg will speak about his memoir, Straight Around Allen, and the Allen Ginsberg Project and Life on Ginsberg's East Hill Farm in Cherry Valley. So both Sunday programs will begin at 3 p.m. in the third floor ballroom of the Village Hall, located at 22 Main Street in Cooperstown. For more information, um, click on the Friends of the Village Library tab on the Village Library of Cooperstown.org homepage. And if you have any questions or comments, including follow-up questions for the speaker, please email fovlfriends22main at gmail.com. And I just want to thank everybody for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.